table here at the Carter Center Forum on Women, Religion, Violence, and Power. Uh, this is part of our ongoing series to amplify the voices of human rights defenders and activists around the world who are working to mobilize action for women and girls um, throughout the world. So we're really happy to have you with us today. We have a very good panel that we're excited to have with experts and advocates from four cities um, here in Atlanta, in Cook County, Illinois, in the Chicago area, Seattle, and Phoenix. And our experts are going to be talking to us today about what they're doing in their cities to advance what we call the Swedish or Nordic model or approach to ending sexual exploitation. That includes human trafficking and uh, prostitution and various forms of sexual exploitation. And to kick it off, I just wanted to uh, let our audience know that President Carter last year wrote a book. I'm going to hold it up here. It's called uh, A Call to Action, Women, Religion, Violence, and Power. And in this book, I rec highly recommend it. There's a whole section on ex sexual exploitation and looking at the various models for combating sexual exploitation. And President Carter, after doing this research, decided that uh, the experiment that had been undertaken in certain Nordic countries, in Sweden, Norway, Iceland, other countries, uh, was really the most promising model for ending sexual exploitation. We hear often in this work, you might hear the expression, the world's oldest profession, and that men will be men, boys will be boys, and that sex will always be for sale, um, and that this is just a normal state of, of the human condition. Uh, but what we're learning is that it doesn't have to be that way. Um, we've, some of our friends in the, in the advocacy world have turned that phrase around into the world's oldest oppression, because it is a reliance on subjugation of women uh, for the sexual purpose of men, mostly 99% of those who buy sex are men, um, in order to, to uh, exploit another human being in this way. And so we have recently convened a summit here at the Carter Center last month in Atlanta. Um, and you can follow the conversation with the hashtag end sex exploitation. Um, very, it was a huge uh, summit a lot of uh, attention on social media, lots of great conversations, and we're so pleased that we have four of our experts here today. And just to start it off with some statistics, what we know from the research um, is that at least 21 million adults and children are bought and sold worldwide into commercial sexual servitude, forced labor, and bonded labor, and about 2 million children are exploited every year in the global commercial sex trade. Uh, be, around 70% um, of those trafficking who are trafficked are trafficked for sex exploitation. Not just uh, forced labor, but actual sexual exploitation. And that women and girls make up 98% of victims of trafficking for sexual exploitation. So these statistics are staggering. And to discuss that with us today, we have experts from four American cities. Uh, Marion Hatcher has been with the Cook County Sheriff's Office for 10 years. She currently serves as the project manager for the Sheriff's Women's Justice Programs, as well as the Human Trafficking Coordinator as, uh, and as a member of the Human Trafficking Response Team in Cook County. Peter Qualiatin has been working to end commercial sex, sexual exploitation for over two decades. He is the co-founder of the Seattle-based Organization for Prostitution Survivors and a coordinator of Buyer Beware, a partnership to end commercial exploitation in King County, Washington State. And Kathleen Wynn is the executive director of the Arizona Anti-Trafficking Network and prior to joining that, Ms. Wynn served as Community Outreach and Education Director for the Arizona Attorney General's Office. Uh, Kathleen will be joining us shortly. And just joining us now is Pastor Paul Palmer, um, who, with his wife, founded the Atlanta Dream Center in 2003. Uh, the following year, in 2004, they began the fight against sexual, sex trade in Atlanta uh, with the Dream Center's ministry arm, Out of Darkness. Uh, and its purpose is to reach, rescue, and restore women that are sexually exploited. We're so grateful to have you 
all four of you. And we'll start with Marion. Marion, if you could briefly describe your personal experience, including how you arrived in your position with the sheriff's office there in Cook County, if you could get us started today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Um, my experience in uh, sexual exploitation came as a result of domestic violence. After 17 years in the corporate sector, uh, basically normal life, um, you know, six-figure salary, supportive family, domestic violence sent me to substance use and uh, substance use and uh, running from life and running from my perpetrator, who at that time was my husband. I eventually ended up involved, as many women do, uh, in the criminal justice system. I eventually ended up in prostitution, which for me, domestic violence was a segue to prostitution, and that is the norm for many, many women, as when you run to the street and you run from everything that you know, uh, the, the, you become vulnerable to that other world. As a result of being uh, introduced to the criminal, criminal justice system, uh, picking up uh, charge, different charges, um, living a, a lifestyle of uh, criminal activity that goes with that, um, I was blessed to be a part of an uh, alternative sentencing uh, relationship that Shares and Justice Programs has with the drug court that I graduated from. Um, I eventually volunteered for 10 months and they found out that I had 17 years in the corporate sector and uh, a skill set, a, you know, a business background and uh, eventually went from volunteering to being a contractual employee. Um, over time, I went from being direct service provider as a contractual employee to a full-fledged sheriff's office employee, uh, went from administrative functions to executive assistant functions and to special projects, which has always been my expertise even in corporate America. And now I am a project manager and actually have moved from Sheriff's and Justice Programs as my primary department to the policy and communications department because of so much of my responsibility falling under policy at this time. So now as the human trafficking coordinator and project manager uh, for many, many different uh, issues, human trafficking has basically taken uh, a great deal of my time and uh, what, it's what the Sheriff of Cook County wants me to focus on. And Marion, just a quick follow-up. What you know at the beginning, I talked about the Swedish model to ending sexual exploitation. Uh, the, there are four elements to that model. Um, one is decriminalizing victims and survivors. Um, the other one is focusing prosecution resources um, on those who perpetrate the crime, which is the customers, the pimps, the profiteers. Um, we know that the statistics show that for every one uh, man that is arrested for prostitution, 25 women are arrested. That's a statistic I've heard recently. Um, the other aspects we'll talk about later as well are public education about sexual exploitation and of course uh, um, making sure that women in prostitution have and who are being trafficked have exit and care services. So as we go forward, I'd love to hear your thoughts too about how those four approaches are being um, followed in Cook County. Um, so it's a sort of an American version of what they're doing in Sweden. Um, so uh, that's wonderful. And I'm going to turn now to, so we're going to keep the conversation going, I'm going to turn to Peter Qualiotin, who has been working in this field for 20 years. And, and talk to us, Peter, about what you're doing in Seattle. Well, in Seattle, I'm a co-founder of an organization called OPS, Organization for Prostitution Survivors. And at OPS, we really tried to embody the spirit of the Nordic model. Um, we were founded by myself and Noel Gomez, who's a survivor of 15 years of prostitution three years ago. And we have three main program areas that we work in that really reflect that spirit of the Nordic model. The first is survivor services, recognizing that adults and children who have been commercially sexually exploited need real alternatives and need exit strategies and, and advocacy and accompaniment when they're exiting prostitution. We also recognize, though, that even if we were able to, buy, to provide resources for every woman and child who wanted out of the life today in Seattle, mm -hmm. unless we address the issue of demand, that there's going to be another generation and another generation that are exploited precisely in this way in order to meet that demand. And so we have a men's accountability program that uh, uh, um, functions to change the norms that support 
exploitation on the side of the on the demand side of the issue. And then the third com component, the third program area that we work in is community education because while we recognize that prostitution is a practice that impacts individuals, that it's also a social practice and a social problem and that historically it's been seen as sort of normative behavior. And so in order to shift those norms, we really need to engage in, in, in some uh, community education practices as well. And um, you know, just to, to to, to give you an example of how those uh, uh, social norms need to shift, I can give my own example. Because 20 years ago when I got started on the issue of prostitution, I wasn't even working on the issue of prostitution. I was working on domestic violence and sexual assault. And if you would have asked me about prostitution at that time, I would have said, well, prostitution, that's a victimless crime. That's something somebody's freely choosing to do. And who am I as a man to tell anybody what they should do with their body or not? And that was about all I thought about it. And it wasn't until I met survivors uh, who, I was in Portland at the time, there were survivors that were, had started an organization there called the Council for Prostitution Alternatives. And when I got to meet these women and got to hear their stories, it really reframed the whole issue of prostitution for me. Um, because although they were adult women, what I learned was most of them had entered into the commercial sex industry as teenagers. Most of them had experienced physical, emotional, sexual abuse, neglect in the home. Many ran away from home or spent a great deal of time away from home to escape the abuse or were in foster care. And then they spent a lot of times on the streets where they were vulnerable and were exploited by significantly older men, pimps, who used physical, emotional, sexual abuse to gain power and maintain control over them and turn them out into systems of prostitution that I really started to recognize were very similar to domestic violence. Mm -hmm. While they were in the life, they experienced sexual assaults, physical assaults, kidnapping, torture, uh, permanent mutilation experience because of that torture, murder rates 18 times that for women not in prostitution, suicide rates that were just off the charts. And I had to look at this and say, you know, this is not in fact a victimless crime. This in fact is a system of men's violence, predominantly men's violence against women and children and sometimes other men. And so for me it was at that point in the mid-90s that I really uh, saw that it was essential for men, especially pro-feminist men who were supportive of women's equality, um, to really t take a stand on this issue and to really have the courage to speak out about this issue um, and without being afraid of, of other men's judgment because I think that often silences men from really being able to speak out in, in advocacy to stop this harmful practice. Um, so as part of those strategies here in Seattle right now, as part of that way that we try to create a de facto Nordic model here, we're working on a project project called Buyer Beware, um, which is a partnership with the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office uh, that's been uh, sponsored by the CEASE Coalition nationally, which is run by Demand Abolition. And um, what we're, we've done here is that we've uh, t totally turned around the arrest ratio. Three years ago in King County, there were three women arrested for every buyer that was arrested in prostitution. As of this year, two buyers that are arrested for each woman that's arrested, and none of those women are being charged. They're being directly diverted to services, pre-arrest diversion to services. So this is really a kind of de facto Nordic model that we've created here. And then uh, I've created a new 10-week sex buyers intervention program that the men are required, and they're convict, prosecuted, convicted, and required as a condition of their sentence, not a diversion, to come to this new program. Um, so th this, in, in conjunction with the community education that we're doing on, in multiple sectors of the community, is the approach that we're taking in Seattle. That's great, Peter. You know, I think part of what, what we have to solve in terms of public policy is what do we do? How do we, I mean, what are the kinds of interventions that are actually going to work? When I hear, uh, when I get questions from people about what to do about it that sort of throw up their hands, that this is just sort of a way things are, um, I love to have these kinds of stories about diversion programs that work. But the other thing that's so important, and we can hear about this more as we go along, um, is that when people sometimes think about prostitution, they think uh, about this idea that these two consenting adults are buying sex and, like you said, who's to blame them? I mean, it's, it's their right if they want to do this. What they don't, what most people don't know is how uh, violent and um, horrific an experience it is that survivors, more and more survivors are being bold and coming forward and telling 
what it's really like, that it's not this wonderful uh, experience of having sex with someone that's so beautiful that this is what, what what's so surprising to me is that many people who look at this issue think of it in that way that it's this wonderful experience that they're having right but when you talk to the men who buy sex they know that, they know that this is not a real consensual activity deep down they may say that it is on the surface but when I ask the men the first day of group I'll ask them, you know, if you pick up somebody who's 15 years old and you ask her how old she is, what is she going to say? And they always say, well, she'll say she's 18. And I ask them, and if you ask them, do you have a pimp? What will they say? And without question, they say, oh, well, she's, she'll say she doesn't have a pimp. And so I ask them, and if you ask her, does she like what she's doing, what will she say? And they always say, she'll say that she loves what she's doing, right? Yeah. And, and then I ask them if that's true, and they recognize that that's false. I mean, it's called a trick for a reason. It's because they're paying for their fantasy of the situation. They're paying for the illusion of consent. But they're actually paying to make darn sure that they're not going to know if there's consent to this, to this activity or not. Well put. Um, that, thanks, Peter. That's just so illuminating. Um, so I'm going to turn now to Kathleen Wynn from Phoenix. Um, they, there was a really amazing effort uh, last year with the Super Bowl um, to, to, to address this problem. And, and can you tell us how it works? I mean, how does a big event like the Super Bowl attract uh, all of this exploitation of human beings, and what did your community do, and your your uh, the the government in Arizona and civil society? How did you all work together, and businesses in particular, to deal with what was happening there around the Super Bowl? Um, thanks, Karen. Well, leading into the Super Bowl, you you know you're getting a Super Bowl two years ahead of time, and so um, and, and on our particular weekend when we had the Super Bowl. We, um, not only do we have the Super Bowl, we have the Phoenix Open, which is a major golf tournament. We also have the Barrett Jackson car auction. So we had thousands and thousands of people coming here, and we knew that that was going to happen. So law enforcement has the, the most critical role, which is public safety during an event when that many people are coming. Uh, the other thing that we had to work on is our laws. Arizona had a gap in their law, much like Peter just mentioned, um, where if you bought a 15 or 17 year old in Arizona, you were then, uh, um, you would go in front of a judge if you got caught and say, I just didn't know. I thought she told me she was 18. I thought she was. And it went from a felony conviction to a misdemeanor. And we knew that that would create a bigger demand here in Arizona if, um, if you could buy children because that boundary has been moving. Um, there's a demand for younger and younger girls. And so, uh, collaboratively, law enforcement, the legislature, uh, at the time I worked for the Arizona Attorney General's office, we drafted a law that went into effect, it's a, not even a year old, but HB 2454, that closed that gap, but also treated these survivors, these um, women, as victims and gave them victim protection. Uh, the other thing that happened is we increased penalties for those that bought or sold uh, children into prostitution and sold adults into prostitution. Many pimps are repeat offenders. This is not their first time. Uh, this is their business. This is their livelihood. As we know, um, you have a stable of four to five to seven women. You can make anywhere from one and a half to three million dollars a year, essentially tax-free because it's a criminal enterprise. So we did, we took this approach to work uh, cross-jurisdictionally with law enforcement all over the state, with FBI, with Border Patrol, and, and, and we trained law enforcement um, over a period of three years. We then moved to our prosecutors and then to our judges because it does us no good uh, to pick up a criminal and then, and then not prosecute. That, that's a wasted effort and, and, it, and it's frustrating to those that are uh, trying to stop this crime. So we've been working along those lines. Most recently here in Arizona, we are working to train our first responders, our uh, EMTs, our hospital personnel, because sometimes a person will, will miss law enforcement and go directly to an emergency room uh, for treatment, because as we know, this is a very violent crime. This is not romantic. Um, sex does not equal love, and this is sex, and it's getting more and more violent. Um, and it is a lot of the ways that 
there is pimp control because of the violence. So we are now training, um, as a matter of fact, just yesterday I got a call from one of the medical centers here, and we're going to be training their doctors as to the signs of trafficking. So we are trying to do a collaborative approach where if you see this crime, report it, let others who are working on this know, and that way comprehensively. Um, and to that end, we're also doing, um, you mentioned business, we're letting business know the cost. We recently did a um, blind ad, it was a fake ad that you put on these posts, and we had over 30 businesses represented, meaning 30 different corporations, and it may have been more than one person from those corporations calling in during their business day to order sex online. So A, that costs the business money, B, there could be some potential fallout if someone in your business is, is, is paying or contributing in a criminal activity. So we're trying to um, continue and broaden the conversation. When you have sporting events, um, it's kind of like Peter also talked, it's that good old boys, business as usual, it's no big deal, it's a sporting event, going large. Um, Law enforcement here says that bachelor parties are a target-rich environment because there seems to be some uh, acceptance culturally, which we know, that this is okay, that it's okay to have a, a dancer or a stripper or a prostitute at a party, or it's okay to have um, you know, women with hardly any clothes on at events. And, and we're not saying don't have fun, don't dress up, but then there's that that, that line that crosses over where people are being forced to be there, where they're being bought and sold for the expressive purpose of sexual exploitation. And that's the line that we're trying to draw. Um, and, we're, and we're doing it with laws, we're doing it with communication, we're doing it with awareness, we're doing it as a collaborative effort with many different agencies, um, identifying uh, children that are at risk in our foster care system. So it, it's not just one place that you find this, and unfortunately, if you find it in a place, you, there's tentacles and it goes out to many other different places. So leading into the Super Bowl, we tried to identify all those different places and, um, and then just create an awareness campaign, which we're continuing to do as of today. You know, Karen, can I just interject in terms of the excellent job that was done uh, you know, as the coordinator of the National Day of John's Arrest, we've been partnering with uh, Phoenix PD. Actually, the entire uh, valley uh, there is now part of the National Day of John's Arrest, and uh, they did a superb job of managing the issue of scores of pimps and traffickers were taken into custody. Um, there was only one high-profile arrest for a buyer out of that entire sporting event, which, of course, is Warren Sapp. Um, they did an, an outstanding job, absolutely amazing. They've always been stellar in terms of their law enforcement capabilities when it comes down to sexual exploitation, prostitution, and trafficking efforts. But in order to uh, maintain such a large uh, event, multiple large events, sporting events, um, they are very much at the top of the list along with Indianapolis. Can I ask you both, um, do you think more high profile, you know, perp walk kind of arrests, and I know, you know, sometimes we, we don't, it's not that we want, we're interested in, in humiliation, if we're talking about trying to change behavior, sometimes you have to avoid extreme humiliation because that makes people hide more, but, um, but do you think high-profile arrests in those scenarios would actually do go far to deter others that would more easily go ahead and buy sex? Absolutely. I think, I think you have to um, make, it's part of the awareness. No, I, I'm not into shaming, I'm not into, um, I, I believe men have an addiction. I believe that there's things that lead it. I'm not letting them off the hook for their behavior, but like a drug, that, it, that also needs to be handled, but I. But if you don't let people know this is happening, and you, we, we just had a ring in a high school. We had, we had high school seniors doing a prostitution ring, pimping and 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 being a hoe. What I've been told by these high school kids is 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 a standard operating procedure that is terribly broken. That is terribly wrong in our culture, and so I think as a way of creating awareness. That is our responsibility. We can't have our high school seniors having prostitution rings, uh, let alone in college or 
and, and there, there seems to be this acceptable um, behavior in our in our culture that this is what we do. We we trade sexual services for money and for items. Um, and and I don't know. It's been a it's been a boundary expansion over the last ten years. Um, but but we, we're drawing a line in the thing here in Arizona. I think the Super Bowl gave us the catalyst and the momentum to do that. But you can't leave, you know, the Super Bowl goes away and you can't stop those efforts. So any city that gets a Super Bowl, they should use those efforts. But then you've got to continue to keep the conversation alive. And Arizona is doing that. So it's very exciting to be here in this conversation. But it's something you have to give a concerted effort to because once, once the, you know, once that goes away, the, the crime does not go away. And as a matter of fact, we're seeing that it's getting worse and expanding. Um, so we are doing everything that we can to educate at every different level in schools, in churches, in business, in law enforcement, in hospitals. Um, if there's a place where this crime is affecting, we are there to have a dialogue and a conversation and to say, here's what happens and here's the cost of this crime and, and what it's going to cost your community in incarcerations and in damage to human beings in just what happens to our survivors. And, and and it's like Peter said, we could not handle if we took every survivor off the street. We don't have a place for this. So what do we do about that? So those are the comprehensive way that we're, we're coming at this problem. We're doing it with regulations, we're doing it with laws, and we're doing it with education. Uh, great. Kathleen, that's great. I'm going to turn to Pastor Paul. Kathleen, could you just do me a favor and mute your microphone? There's a bit of an echo coming. Um, and sure. I want to see if it's uh, coming from there, but um, that's amazing. Great, great input. And um, so, Pastor Paul, talk to us about what you're doing with the Atlanta Dream Center and Out of Darkness, and how you're, you know, how how you're working with victims and survivors, and, and what is the, I mean, I think part of what we've actually got to to understand is that. We have an opportunity to 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 make a dent in this, as Kathleen was saying. It's such a big problem. But in order to encourage people who are believing that this is a way of life that they can actually benefit from, sometimes it's young people, sometimes it's adults. We've got to get that message out there. And you're doing so much in this regard. Tell us what you're doing in Atlanta. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for letting me be a part of this this wonderful event today as well. I want to go back to your question real quick. You talked about high pro profile arrest. I think any publication of any arrest will have an effect on our communities. And um, I, again, I'm not into shaming uh, to the point of shame, but if we could deter uh, buyers because they're fearful that their name may become public, I, I think I, I am for that, whether they're high profile or not. Here in the city of Atlanta, uh, we took this on a few years back, ten, a decade or so, and it was mainly because of some of the statistics that came out through our mayor, uh, Shirley Franklin. And the statistics changed, and I understand that they can vary upon the questions that is asked, but we are definitely one of the major cities for child prostitution, regardless how what survey you look at, and that is a shameful um, um, reputation to have as a city of as a city of Atlanta. So we started taking it on, and we do a reach, rescue, and a restoration, and now a reentry. And I'll try to summarize it quickly. Our reach is where where the streetwalkers are at. We go out on a weekly basis. We're very consistent to be out there on a regular basis. Second thing is we're in the prisons or the jails, seven county or city jails here in the metro area. Uh, this is a great opportunity. Those seven jails, if a woman is arrested, uh, taken in for prostitution, it is a mandate that they give us, they're given a, a phone number, our phone number, to reach out to see if they need help or just to have somebody to mentor them or counsel them or put them in a program when released from prison. Uh, or jail, and uh, that is part of our reach. We're also, as Kathleen said, in Phoenix, we train uh, medical students. We were just at Emory uh, a couple of weeks ago training their nurses uh, in one of their courses on recognizing those who are trafficked and how to um, elude them away from their buyer. Many times they are with their buyers when they go into a, a checkup or to have some type of medical procedure taken, and uh, they're difficult to release them from or get them released from their their pimp. So uh, just training on how to do that as well. And then we have a 24-hour hotline. We have a 10, it's not a call center like you would see a regular call center. These are actually 10 volunteers that the number is routed to their phone uh, at any given time. It could be in the middle of the night. Uh, they'll take that call and they're responsible. If the woman just wants to talk, we the first 
four months or five months, give me, forgive me, one of those four or five months, we received over 2,000 phone calls here in Atlanta of women that were trafficked and had that number. Uh, and a lot of it is just, uh, psychologists tell us, testing escape or testing a rescue. Uh, they want to know if there's really hope for them. So a lot of times it's just a phone call, a phone call of encouragement. Uh, sometimes they'll call and hang up, but nevertheless, if they're ready, uh, we make a uh, rescue plan for them. Uh, we don't bust into doors and have guns or anything of that nature. We set up, find a safe place, and uh, we have trained volunteers, a man and a woman, that will meet them and pick them up. If we um, feel it's a dangerous situation when we arrive, we do call the local police to assist us in this rescue. And then at that point, we have safe homes. We call them Solomon Houses. We have three safe homes. We take them there immediately. There's no requirement of blood work. There's no requirement of sobriety. Uh, we don't care if they have warrants at that moment. Uh, we just want them off the streets into a safe place. And there they receive everything new, clean sheets, brand new sheets, not clean sheets, new sheets, new clothing, everything that they own. They can burn it if they like. Uh, everything is supplied for them. And they're there for up to about 30 days. Uh, we give them a caseworker. They are... Uh, evaluated. There's three areas of evaluation, whether they have mental illness, uh, if it's drug addiction or trauma. And we have over 30 long-term programs across the United States that we use as our means of restoration. Uh, during that time, they're given a mentor. They have somebody that's connected with them. We just don't send them off to another program and kiss them goodbye. We're with them throughout their 12 or 18 month program. And there, when they come to a place of graduation, and uh, we have found uh, graduation was a great thing for them, but uh, all of a sudden they were kicked out of the nest when they got their diploma. And uh, it was difficult for these girls to become uh, part of our society again and uh, find a job that was sufficient to maintain their lifestyle or at least give them a living, a good living. And so we are now working with businessmen and owners of um, uh, companies that will hire these girls without any exploitation of them whatsoever, without any shame. Uh, just hiring them as though they're hiring a regular employee from somewhere else. And that will sustain them for life-giving skills or life uh, uh, livelihood. And uh, it's just been a wonderful situation. Last year we took 264 women out of prostitution, uh, not just here in Atlanta, but mainly here in the region of Atlanta, but across the United States as well as we worked with different law enforcement, federal agencies as well. And so that, that's just amazing. And, and you talked about your reentry program. I think that's so important because I think one of the arguments I hear um, against um, this kind of rescue, um, you know, sort of outreach and uh, let's say proactive uh, trying to get women out of prostitution. Some people say, well, that's quite, uh, you know, patronizing. Who are we to step into these women's lives and interfere this way? Um, you know, part of the argument I hear is that they don't have another option. There's nothing there else for them to do. And so the idea of creating and working with businesses to create opportunities for women um, and for anyone who's sexually exploited in this way is a wonderful story. And I understand that your numbers are going up. That the more that the more that's known about your program, the more people that you have. You're expecting even more this year, more uh, people coming into your program. The other thing that just happened was this: the Congress passed the Justice for Victiming, Victims of Trafficking Act, the JVTA, and I understand that through that fund, some 75 million dollars is going to become available uh, for programs, for restoration programs, and for reentry programs for victims. Is that right? It is, yes, and that is great news for us that are in the fight. And I'm going to go back to that statement that you just made as though we're interfering with these women's lives. Um, we have never uh, coerced or forced. We've just made opportunity. And these women willfully want out. And they're afraid. Uh, that's why they call so many times. They're afraid of first being found out by their pimp or we won't be able to help them. And uh, as, the, as our name or the ministry or this work has gone forth, our reputation has expanded among those that are in trafficking, and uh, so we are we are not the voice anymore. The women themselves have become voices to other women that are uh, being exploited, and, and uh, so often when a girl calls, they'll say, so-and-so called me, and they told me about the program, and they've graduated, and they reached out to me, and I, I can you help me? So uh, this is not a coercion, but this is a, a place where these girls can freely call, feel that there's hope for them, and want to change in their life. As Peter said, uh, you know, the the image of, of the general public is that this is 
uh, something that women have chose to do for a living, that this is what they enjoy, and that is such a misnomer. And uh, these women can testify that this is never what they grew up to want to be. They didn't uh, at seven say, I want to become a prostitute when I become of age or, or even as a minor. And uh, so this is by no means a coercion, but just an opportunity for these women to find uh, enormousy in their life once again. Well, it's an amazing, it's an amazing support. And Marion, I was going to ask you to chime in here because yeah, I was just going to jump on in there. Yeah, go, go ahead. So, as one of the women that we're talking about, I've personally experienced the exploitation that uh, is such a human rights violation. Um, coming into it at a later age, uh, doesn't matter when you enter. It doesn't matter whether you're a minor or whether you're. Uh, you know, a teenager, a young adult, or uh, a mature woman, as I was, because I entered the sex trade uh, at uh, 38 years old after the domestic violence um, that we discussed earlier. The most important thing, and and you know, the, I always appreciate those who are in this fight, and uh, everyone that's on uh, part of this experience here today. I'm very grateful for you and your energy and your work and your passion. I can tell you that no woman, it's not something, if it were something that was going to be you know, a job function, it would be taught in the schools. It's not something that we see in the curriculum. You know, uh, Sex Trade 101 is not something that you see in uh, the formative years in kindergarten, third grade, fifth grade, seventh grade, or high school. So no, it's not something, it's something these, this, the pro-sex workers might say, but once they are a mature adult, not when the minor you know, is trying to figure out what they're going to do with their lives. Here in Cook County, I was rescued by angels with handcuffs. And sometimes that is the segue to getting help, uh, being arrested. For me, that's what happened. The programming that we have here, we've always provided services to women since the late 1990s because there was an increase in the population of women coming into the Cook County Jail. Uh, and then women coming into jail across the country for many, many charges. We had an increase in the number of women coming into Cook County Jail in 2008 for the charge of prostitution and Sheriff Dart developed uh, the human trafficking response team at that time that took three sex trafficking survivors, women who have backgrounds, including myself, uh, to join forces with and work side by side with our vice unit. As a result of that, we provided a intervention to nearly 600 women since 2000, February 2009. And we have, through the Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority, uh, human trafficking beds that we provided nearly 200 women the opportunity to be in uh, 90 days or more of continued or for the first time some of the women that come out of our jail-based program can go there it's a recovery home environment and or other women that we place from around the country we place women from North Dakota we place women from Ohio from Wisconsin um, into our human trafficking program where they get therapeutic treatment, integrated uh, trauma-driven, trauma-informed services, and they can be there for a minimum of 90 days or more. We have a 73% success rate from that program, and uh, in terms of women deciding that they will actually have uh, a conversation, take our number, whether or not they accept the services at that time, and Pastor Paul will tell you, sometimes they just need to talk, sometimes they they're not quite right, they're feeling it out, because they're very surprised, especially Pastor Paul, it won't surprise you that women are, they're thrown for a loop when uh, our investigators pick them up and give the opportunity to talk to a survivor of prostitution and and not be charged with, uh, charged, you know, for the first time in their lives, and that they have the alternative, and they can talk to us, whether it's two o'clock in the morning, uh, we're on call 24-7. Um, they can talk to us and, and take the advantage of those services, whether it's today or sometimes they don't want to talk to us right then. But every woman that's picked up for the charge of prostitution by Cook County Sheriff's Police Department is provided our, our information. If we don't talk to them that night, we do follow up with every woman that is in the system for the charge currently or a history of prostitution. We have a team of, of women that work very diligently to make contact, whether it be in the courtroom 
or just making a follow-up phone call so that we do indeed make sure they know we're still here for them. Many women don't come to us until years later and ask for help, which I'm sure doesn't surprise anyone that's a part of this work. Sometimes they're just not ready, but when they're ready, we're here. That's wonderful. And I, I wonder, if Marianne, if you could tell us how the contrasting approach of the Cook County uh, Sheriff's Office contrasted with the City of Chicago, you were mentioning that, how important it is to have sort of a, a strategy that's coordinated within a particular um, regional area or geographic area. Can you talk about that a bit? Sure. Well, the difference between what's going on with the Cook County uh, Sheriff's Office and um, local partners for the National Day of John's Arrest is that we have in Cook County an ordinance, Public Morals Nuisance Ordinance, and that Public Morals Nuisance Ordinance gives us the opportunity to, when a man is picked up by our Sheriff's Police Department, they are there's a five hundred thousand dollars uh, fine for trying to buy sex, as well as we have zero tolerance on the street for using a vehicle for the purpose of trying to buy sex. So there's additional fine penalties and the tow fees as well. All of that money goes into the Women's Justice Fund. 60% goes towards rehabilitation uh, sort of services for adult women. 40% goes to services for juvenile girls and are uh, also in the Cook County uh, uh, detention uh, centers. Uh, so it's a 100% restorative justice uh, model. The money comes from the perpetrators, goes into the fund, the funding goes for services 100% for women and girls. I also like models that have some of the funding going towards increasing law enforcement's capacity to uh, to do this work because it's very expensive to do bursting operations and, and use undercover female officers to do the work. And I can use that as maybe a segue just you know, briefly to talk about the National Day of John's arrest and our partnership nationwide. The uh, National Day of John's Arrest was the brainchild of Sheriff Dart. And we piloted it back in 2011 with eight jurisdictions, and it's now grown to more than 70 jurisdictions. And we've arrested nearly 3,000 buyers of sex nationwide and growing. What's important about that is that we have the buy in at the highest level of law enforcement across the country. In all of those jurisdictions, we work hand in hand with FBI, local, state, national, with uh, Homeland Security, with the U.S. attorneys, and, um, uh, and we make sure that each each jurisdiction that does get it and knows that we have to look at this in terms of a uh, economic model that has a human impact um, and go after the demand. I mean, it's, and I go back to the Twinkies. When they took Twinkies off the shelf, everybody lost their mind, and Twinkies are now back on the shelf. And so demand is drive, you know, and the economic model of any, of any marketing uh, uh, situation that we can come up with. So when we uh, impact, when we have a, a huge impact on demand and those who are trying to buy sex, we don't have to worry about the pimps and traffickers at that point because we'll put them out of business. They won't have anything to manage. That's right. Can I, can I jump in here? Peter, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I want to extend the conversation uh, beyond just talking about the issue of demand because I think that the issue of demand is, is frames things in purely economic terms and I think this is connected to a broader issue of men's entitlement and that that's that really underscores that this is a form of gender-based violence that is connected with domestic violence connected with sexual assault and sexual harassment and that by addressing this fundamental issue of men's entitlement we're going to be able to reduce not only commercial sexual exploitation but other forms of men's violence um, and I think that it's really important to take some clues from the movement, the feminist movement, to end gender-based violence, domestic violence, and sexual assault when we're doing our work on commercial sexual exploitation. And a lot of what we found to be successful is this whole process of engaging the bystander, and specifically engaging men who aren't perpetrators in order to change the norms, in order to stop the practices of those who are. Um, I did uh, uh, had, was a co-author on a research study with Melissa Farley in 2011, and we looked at a hundred men in Boston who bought sex and a hundred men in Boston who didn't buy sex. And there was a lot of really interesting stuff that came out of that. But one of the very interesting things for me was that of those 100 men who did not buy sex, many of them said that it was okay for those that did. 
Yeah. And so this is a this is a focus population that it's really important to um, to, to spend some time and energy energy to engage. Um, and this was corroborate. This has been something that's been corroborated for me in the anecdotes that I've heard from survivors of prostitution over the years, um, who have described to me this phenomenon that happens at bachelor parties. And some women have said that when they would get the call to work at a bachelor party by the best man, they would show up at the party. They would end up in a room with the groom, and that many times the groom would say, I don't want to do anything, but don't tell the guys out there. And so I think part of the challenge to men is what do we need to do to get the ethical courage to stand up and tell the guys out there that this is not okay, that this is a practice of inequality, a practice of the subordination of women to men. And it's something that really needs to be stopped and that you know our, everyone's liberty depends on it. And, and, and Karen, can I add something? Yes, else? please, yes, Kathleen. Um, and one of the things in Arizona, we actually have created a group called AZ Men, Arizona Men, and we're we're doing exactly that. And if I, as a woman, tell you not to do something, you hear it as nagging, or your your sister, your wife, your mother. But we know that if we have men tell men not to do something, men really seek out other men's approval, um, and their behaviors are dictated. Um, by other men. So we're really looking to create that man to man conversation. Um, we know that majorly most of the buyers, whether they're buying boys or girls, um, are men. And um, if we don't change that and we don't change this kind of wink and nod, like this is okay uh, mentality, uh, this crime continues to be perpetrated. So the the impact with men, men's organizations like we had with International Rotary, although that's not a purely man's organization, there's a lot of businessmen involved. We have to let them start to see the cost, and even if it's an economic financial cost, by by creating this other population of victims as a result of their actions. Yeah. And and I think the human cost and the and the economic costs are all they're all tied in together, but, we, but if you don't let people know this action here is causing this result over here, it's a missed opportunity with our populations that we're trying to educate. I just wanted to... That's right. That's wonderful uh, to hear about all these efforts in different cities. And, um, you know, when I... One of the ways that the Carter Center became involved in this work was when I heard Pastor Paul um, talk about how religious communities and faith leaders and leaders of churches have failed our boys in educating them about human dignity of their of the of young women that there are these young boys and and we, so I want to ask Pastor Paul but just before I turn it to you what well, one of the interventions we had at the summit was so devastating because it showed that uh, internet pornography is making this problem so much worse because of the easy access that boys have to extreme and violent pornography that our boys are being traumatized and also induced into this viewpoint that uh, that Peter was just describing, this idea that we have this entitlement and this is part of what it means to be a man. Um, so Pastor Paul, can you talk about what you think what about moral education? You know, people. Most people in this country are religious. What if our churches and our mosques and synagogues and whatever religious or non-religious ethics-based system that you're a part of, whether the leadership in those institutions were to really bring this home and teach about equal human dignity and the costs of this type of exploitation? Do you think that would have an impact? Yeah, Karen. Obviously, it would. Um, you know, I, I think it's an obligation. I don't think it's an option for us in the religious realm or in the Christian realm or any, any faith base. I think it's an obligation to our young men to uh, teach them about masculinity. And there is a masculinity. We want to fade it out. We just have a misconcept what masculinity is. We think masculinity is overpowering. We think it is being strong. But masculinity is actually a sense of protection. And we're, I don't believe we're training our children to grow up to protect humanity. I, I believe it's I, almost even in our public schools, it's you could achieve, you could be whatever you want. And it's almost a ladder, step ladder, in my opinion, rather than joining together to make this a better world, joining together to protect one another, to honor one another, and, and to give to give dignity. And um, I think the greatest place is probably behind the pulpit of whatever faith you may be, to take this opportunity, not only to talk about the faith and this creator, this God in which we adore, 
But if we, being made in his image, sharing that same love and that same respect for one another, cross-gender. And um, <clears throat> listen, I, I, I miss my sound a little blissful. I feel that I'm masking. I ride a Harley Davidson. Isn't that weird? <laughs> Isn't that an odd concept? I ride a Harley, so I think I'm masculine. But in my masculinity, I should be able to get off that bike and stop violence against women, stop in the exploitation of sex trafficking as a human, not just as a man, but I think men need to stand up to this, this issue and say, I'm not going to stand for it any longer. Uh, being that man that comes out of the bedroom with the prostitute at his bachelor party and says, this is not who I am. I'm going to be loyal to my wife, and this woman has dignity, and I'm not going to steal it from her at any cost. And, but I do believe it should start not only in the home, but that should be the first place. But secondly, in a place of our place of faith or place of worship. Third, in the place of education. And these are things we don't want to touch. We don't want to touch on the morality in the public arena. And I think it has caused a deterrent to our government, to a deterrent to our society in which we live today. So that's great. And that's a segue into our concluding remarks for everyone because I think then what we have to think about is what do we do? And, and each of you are doing amazing work. So maybe you could uh, uh, share with our audience what you think people can do in their churches, synagogues, mosques, places of worship, in their, in their homes, uh, but also in the policy arena because we do, we do have to have a legal framework you know, that is supportive of what we're talking about. So I think there's, there are those, all those dimensions that you mentioned. Um, so it, it, I'm going to start with Marion and go in the same order that we, we went in before. If you can just talk to our audience, ask them what they can do in their communities or at the national level with their members of Congress, et cetera, to be a, a supporter in this. And I'll just say this little bit of um, uh, advertising. The hashtag end sex exploitation is the hashtag we're using for this conversation. So anyone who wants to converse, meet, connect with other people about this issue, how they can connect, use the hashtag end sex exploitation and maybe you'll connect with efforts that you'd like to be involved with. So Marianne, why don't you get us started in our final uh, quick two minutes each of what we want to ask our audience to do. Well, first of all, I want to tell you, the audience what we shouldn't do and uh, I want to, uh, as a one of my roles for the Sheriff's Office, I'm one of the coordinators for the CEASE Network, um, uh, Cities Empowered Against Sexual Exploitation, 11 cities that are working on the ground level to, um, to try to bring an end to this travesty, this human rights uh, violation. One of the things that we don't want to do, and one of the very important pieces of data that we get from Demand Abolition and CEASE Network is that we're talking about 15%, the estimated 15% of the population of men by sex. So we're saying 85% of the population are potential male allies that we need to work with. Um, we need to engage them, but what I want to tell you that we should not do initially is that we should not legalize prostitution. Because prostitution always uh, has and was all, it would always will harm women and girls. And, legalizing it, you know, the buying and selling of women is basically promoting uh, and profiting from mar the marginalization and abuse of women and girls. So, you know, we're making it more harmful if we even think about something like that. Um, it doesn't decrease the physical danger and emotional harm. Um, and uh, basically, uh, there's no way to make it a little bit better. There's no way to, you know, soften the blow, so to speak. And so we need to abolish it, not legalize it. Um, we've seen everywhere that where prostitution is uh, is legal that trafficking increases. Um, according to a study of 150 countries, wherever prostitution was legalized, trafficking increased. And the reason for that is because it welcomes uh, the pimps and traffickers and uh, other types of criminal activity. Uh, legalization of prostitution in Nevada and the Netherlands resulted in an increase in child prostitution. and um, wherever there's uh, children in prostitution, the, the sex industry uh, seems to thrive even more. But in all of the areas, Nevada, Germany, Australia, the Netherlands, Netherlands uh, there's also an increase in illegal prostitution activity. Um, you know, right here at home in Nevada, 81% of the women uh, in the legal brothels really want to get out. They just don't feel they have other options for survival. Um, most of them were homeless. They were either homeless when they entered the legal brothels uh, or they were brought in by pimps. So then they're effectively, they're 
legally and illegally pimped in that area. And since 2002, when prostitution was legalized in Germany, at least 55 women in prostitution have been murdered by sex buyers or by people in the red light districts. In addition to those 55 deaths, there were 29 attempted murders. On the flip side, though, Sweden, which has an abolitionist law on prostitution, they've had no prostitution-related murders in that same time period. So we want to look at progressive laws that promote women's equality, as uh, Peter uh, was speaking to, and not women's prostitution. We must work uh, as a community and uh, elect lawmakers that care about this subject. We have to support the uh, President Carter Initiative and the Demand Abolition and Cease Network Initiatives, but we have to get involved uh, with those initiatives wherever we can. If it means that it's just a matter of voting and voting for the right people, that's great. If it means it's a matter of uh, you know pushing the right button for a particular uh, referendum, that's great too. If it means going to uh, a place of worship and finding out more, if it means going to a uh, you know a town hall meeting, finding out what you can do, that's great. If it means you know just doing research on your on your own, that's great. But I'll be honest with you. This is uh, if we want to, we have to hit the problem where it's at right now. But for many people, I want to leave you with this. This is for us to have a long-term uh, paradigm shift. Ten, ten years or more, twenty-five years or more. We really have to start in the home. We have to start with our families and rebuild the family unit. Teach young men to respect women at an early age, and teach young women that they don't have to be victimized. And, and, and liberate them as um, I liked what uh, was said by Gail Dines um, at the uh, summit. Liberation, liberate, it's something that's it's a unified term. We want to empower the individual, but we also want to liberate our, our, ourselves as a group and as a, a, a society. And so let's start in the home. Pastor Paul, I'm sure you would agree with me that we can really try to make a difference within the home that everything eventually will be all right. And we're talking the homes across the world. Thank you. That's great, uh, Miriam. Thanks. And we've got um, just a couple minutes left. So Peter, uh, Paul, and Kathleen, if you can give me one minute each of your concluding thoughts. Um, and thank you very much for your participation today. Well, I think first and foremost, we need to support exit uh, services for women that are survivor-informed and survivor-led. That's absolutely a priority whenever we're doing this work. Mm -hmm. I think also that we need to to uh, to work on issues of men's accountability, that we definitely need to, to work whatever ways we can on an individual level, person to person, um, uh, adult to child, uh, friend to friend, mm -hmm. brother to brother, sister to brother, that we need to have these difficult conversations. Because what I found from working over 20 years with men who buy sex is that most of them feel ambivalent. There's been very few, maybe three, that I've ever met out of the hundreds of men I've worked with who feel great about what they're doing. In fact, they're trying to meet needs through the purchase of sex that are never going to met, be met this way. They're trying to meet relational needs through non-relational sexual activity. And so you can't get there from here. And so I think that men and boys are brought up in a culture to believe that there's a certain limited notion of eroticism that's based on inequality that they're supposed to be after that's going to meet their emotional needs. And we need to make, I'm consistently talking with men about becoming connoisseurs of their emotions and being able to talk with other people about how they're feeling, being able to recognize what their emotional needs are and, their empath and create empathy and compassion for others. Because while I support the rhetoric about men need to fight this issue, I think men fighting is not going to solve this issue. Men need to invite one another into new levels of intimacy, of emotional caring with one another, of sharing with one another, that do not subordinate women in any way, and that this is going to be the way through when men have a change of heart around this issue and recognize it's in our own best interest to change. Because when I ask men what they most want, what they most value, it's consistently relationships based. Right? And then to try and get those needs met through non-relational sexual activity is just totally counterproductive to getting there. And so I think that men are hungry for this message. Men are hungry for the opportunity to step into a fuller humanity that doesn't require the subordination of half the human population. Well said. Kathleen, over to you. Um, I'm just going to say that there's another place, too, that this is a learned behavior. 
So we, we need to go back. Yes, we don't treat prostitution 101 in the third grade, but what are we teaching in the third grade? So let's stop taking the people out at the end. Where we, we're all dealing with the consequences of not having equal uh, of gender equality, of not having respect for one another. So, so let's make a concerted effort with our children, with our families, with the dynamic that we have in our communities. And let's say, let's stop putting people in prison. Let's stop doing all the things that we are doing that are contributing to this crime. And um, we didn't start here. We didn't have this happening at the breadth and depth that it was 20 years ago. So what can we do to do, to do a, a interruption line in our communities mm -hmm. that, that creates us from not doing this in the future? We can. It's going to take some work to undo this. But it's there to be done, and I think we have everyone's attention. So let's use this movement as a way of re-educating our children into the into better behaviors, into behaviors of respect and love. And I think that that can contribute to much of what everyone has said so far. Thank you. Thanks, Kathleen. And Pastor Paul, I'm going to give you the last word before I make a concluding uh, advertisement for our next roundtable. Go ahead, right. Pastor Paul. I agree with Kathleen, uh, training and teaching our children, but I believe we need to change the mindset of our society that this is not the oldest profession, but one of the oldest means of slavery. Mm -hmm. And getting that mindset to change in our communities, I think is the greatest asset we could do to fight this sense of trafficking. And I'm so thankful for the Carter Center and living in his city and being a part of this today, Karen. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all, and I just want to let you know there's another part that I didn't mention, which is the UN Convention on the, on Ending Sex Exploitation that um, the, our summit embraced and President Carter has embraced. It's the idea of a United Nations uh, a convention um, that will fill the gap um, in terms of international legal norms, that will promote the Nordic and Swedish approach globally, and this is uh, an, an, eff an effort that's going to be going forward um, in the coming uh, months and years. Um, and just final note, um, our next roundtable will be, speaking of equal rights of women, um, Jessica Newworth is the author of the book Equal Me Means Equal um, about the equal right, that it's time to pass the equal rights amendment in this country, that women are not equal under the law in this country, which most people do not realize. So Jessica um, is going to come here on July 9th and do a roundtable with us and a number of other advocates talking about the new campaign to pass the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, our audience would be interested in noting that Meryl Streep wrote a letter to every member of Congress earlier this week with Jessica's book, um, asking them to support the Equal Rights Amendment campaign. So this is another way that the Carter Center is going to be asking uh, women and men together to fight for equal rights uh, of women. That will be July 9th right here at noon again on our Forum on Women uh, re virtual roundtable every two weeks here at the Carter Center. Thank you very much to all of our panelists and we'll keep in touch. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.